Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Like, again, thank you very much for all the speakers and everyone here. Amina, thank you very much. Again, that's the first line that I just wrote what I was saying. Because I think the issue with BME is not all, all black experiences are the same, let alone different ethnic minority experiences. And one of my earliest experiences was when I moved into Stockwell in 1989 at just five years old. And that was, um, oh, six years old, sorry, my maths is a bit bad. And that was really like my first real memorable experience. And that was of the young kids on the estate coming over. They were mainly West Africans and Caribbean and coming over and saying, where are you from? And I said, Somalia. And they said, no, India. And I was really confused. I said, no, Somalia. And they said to me, no, India. And in 1989, that was, that was a year, year and a half before the, the Civil War kicked off and we were plastered all over the TV and identifiable by, you know, the, the kind of malnutrition of, of the skinny body and, you know, the, 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 the big head and the flies on our face and all the poverty and famine associated with that. And it was at that point where, you know, we started to become accepted as, 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 as a people that can have an identity, which for me was interesting because that experience didn't come from white people. For me, that, that experience came from within the community, again, that we're, we're kind of entrenched and, and, and really um, involved in now. And that was exactly as, as Amina was just saying, it was, it was that exact situation. Um, I'm just going to start with, um, I grew up in Stockwell, went to a local school. The secondary school, we had um, five head teachers in five years. So every year our head teacher got sacked. Um, sorry, every year our head teacher got sacked. Um, out of 240 of us, seven of us got five ATCs. So it was, we were not, what we was encouraged to do wasn't aspire. We wasn't encouraged to succeed. We wasn't even really being encouraged to, to survive, if I'm honest with you. It was just about see what you can do. Um, again, by the grace of God, I, I went to a, 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 a grant maintained school in two in called Graveney. Uh, that totally blew my mind because of the culture shift. These kids, I, I remember walking to my first chemistry lesson and I went and sat at the back and everyone sat at the front. So I was left by myself thinking, what's going on? And my mum, up until today, reminds me, I came home after that first day and said to her, mum, I don't like this school. These kids, they, they're not normal. Like, they seem to be enjoying what's going on in school. And for me, even when we're talking about race, it was interesting because growing up, I never identified race as, as one of the things that was an issue to me because it was so entrenched. You know, it was, it was confusing when you're a, a black male. You know, I had a beard growing from quite, quite a young age. So I was easily identifiable as, as a Muslim, especially because I prayed five times a day and everyone got to see that. Um, I'm coming from an area of poverty. So I don't know if it, why I was being targeted. And, and that was interesting because growing up, you start to figure out how, how things work. I ended up getting into uni. I went and um, done my first degree in biomedical science at London Metropolitan University. Uh, because I'm Muslim, I, I didn't take a student loan. So I've done four jobs, seven days a week for four years in order to, to, to get through that. I ended up um, doing a PGC to become a science teacher. I've done a, a master's in forensic science. And then I, in 2016, I got honorary PhD. I'm a director of two um, award-winning companies. Uh, um, the main one being the Bricks Soup Kitchen that helps uh, homeless people and people that are, that are um, struggling or suffering. Uh, we won a lot of awards, but again, by the grace of God, um, from the South London Press to Back to Black Inspiration Award to the Greater Heights. Um, it, we were... Um, um, I uh, celebrated by the Evening Standard three years in a row as the top 1,000 influential Londoners. And I think it was topped off by um, my appointment as a counsellor in, in Lambeth. But let me contrast that quickly because I've done every single thing that my mom ever told me. Well, most things, if I'm honest with you. And, you know, I, I was never in a gang. I've never been involved in criminality. You know, I, I stuck with the right crowd. I've done everything that I felt I was supposed to do. And, you know, the connotation was that if you do these things and you stay away from these things, you will get success. However, in 1999, at the age of 15, I was the victim of a stabbing in Brixton as a result of an attempted robbery that I decided to fight back in. And, and in 2008, actually, during the time frame where I was a teacher at a school, uh, while breaking up a fight, I ended up being a victim of a shooting. So I got shot in my shoulder. The bullet um, hit my shoulder, cut the nerve to my whole arm, shattered my rib, my rib hit my lung, collapsed my lung, and the bullet stopped half a centimetre away from my spine. I was off work for six months. Now, as if that wasn't enough, 
um, I, I was vilified in, 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 in the media. They turned around and said, I had an argument with a group of 16 year olds in a chicken shop, which was quite embarrassing for me because I'm a youth worker, you know, and I'm thinking that oh, there goes my street cred. <laughs> All the kids are going to think I'm scared of them. Um, you know, um, I got vilified by the, my own community. So the, I used to work with the hardest to reach and engage young people in school. And a lot of the parents actually started writing into the head teacher saying, oh, you've, you've, um, in, why have you employed a gang member? Um, I heard he got shot in a drug deal gone wrong. His enemies came out of prison and shot him. Um, I was involved in a, in a gun battle where I was shooting back, which was horrible, especially considering I was, I was in intensive care actually trying to survive. And the police, uh, they attended the, the hospital on the day that I got shot while I was in intensive care. And despite all the tubes in my face, they tried to get a statement out of me without me using words, which was a really interesting, um, interesting scenario, if I'm honest with you. So uh, thankfully, I, I recovered. The head teacher turned around and, and actually gave me an extension to my contract. She had so much faith in me. Um, and she, so she gave me an extra year extension. I got paid while I was still off and I, I retained my position, which I'm eternally grateful for because, again, con Hello, sorry. So considering what she could have done, for me, it was, it was weird because the people that were accusing me of these things didn't even know me. Um, actually took five years for me to be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. You know, so for that whole five years, I was hyper-vigilant, I was hyper-aggressive, I was constantly on my toes believing something bad would happen to me simply because I existed, if that makes sense. Um, and that's really exhausting. But interesting part was um, I remember constantly getting stopped by armed police. And you can imagine that kind of trauma that's, that's kind of supporting because they were stopping me with guns and it was always hard stops, which meant that they would point the guns, skid their car in front of you, shouting at all directions, we get you on the floor. And it was really started to get to me because it was almost daily. And I, w I, I would, went on to find out that I actually had 12 gun tags associated with my car, which meant every time they, they ran my plates, they said I was suspected of being involved in 12 different shootings. And that was primarily because of the youth work that I was doing at the time, which meant that I engaged with a lot of young people on the estates. So they were just seeing my car and say, oh, he looks suspicious and putting information. But also the most interesting part of that was the fact that one of the shootings I was suspected of being involved in was my own. Now, I, I, I say these things because that was my experience. And at the time, I, I didn't necessarily feel that like it was because I was black. I just thought to myself, oh, you know, you, you, you're, you're kind of taught to trust in the system. You know, the system's fair and it's not a person. It's, it's, it's enshrined in legislation and people are held accountable to it. And I started to feel like that wasn't true. And for me, what was interesting is that what was worse than being black, and I think it's still true now, is being young and black. And for me, even when we look in, in the newspapers and the media that we get all our information from, the question is, how accurate are these things and what picture are they trying to paint? So the public image of young people, for example, last year, the media um, reported, and, and this is statistically correct, there was about 135 murders in, in the capital last year. And every single time there was a murder, you'll say, you'll see a young person, seventh young person to be knifed to death or ninth murder. And, you know, it's all this connotation associated with our young people. But when you looked at the statistics out of 135 murders, 49 was of young pe people under the age of 25. And just 36 was people under the age of 21, which is what I class as young people. And this include Abdi Ali, who was found in the loft of, of um dead in the loft of an elderly white couple. It includes 11-week-year-old um, Lily who was found um, non-responsive in the house. So things not necessarily related to violence or even gang membership. But the way it was put to us, it has even led us, people within our own community, to look at our kids with a bit sideways and say, look, you're a threat, without knowing anything about them. And I think that's one of the, the worst things that, that has come out of this whole kind of environment that's been created. Again, according to statistics, uh, if we look at more about our attack on our young people, just being black, as if just being black weren't enough, or we've got a third of 19 year olds don't have a level three education. Um, black residents are four, like, four times more likely to be unemployed. Again, that includes young people. One in three of our children in, in Lambeth is born directly into poverty, which is uh, shocking. 
a child born in a poor borough is, eight, eight, is likely to live eight years less than someone born in a, in a wealthy, wealthy, um, wealthy borough. Three, he, you're 300 times more likely to be overweight if your parents are overweight. And we know we have a, a real problem in, in our community. So for me, it's, it's quite a harrowing experience that we're going through. But I really wanted to end this on more of a positive note in terms of what we can do. So I feel like, especially with this whole, you know, the murder of, of George Floyd, we know it's not the first time a black man's been murdered, but this for me feels different. And for me, as a result of that, I'm hopeful. However, I don't feel that hopeful if we don't act properly, if we don't take advantage. So I always like to look at our community's response. What is our responsibility? How do we hold people to account? And I'm really happy to hear of how many, you know, parliamentary candidates that we have in the group just now, you know, who, who come from our background. But it's also really sad that they're not MPs right now, you know, and, you know, it could be because of a number of issues. But for me, there we have to keep our finger on the post. Again, one of the things that, that, that really helped me in terms of my journey was I wanted to understand how the system worked. So when I kept getting stopped and searched, I think the last, the final straw for me was an officer um, on a bike pulled up to me outside of McDonald's in Brixton. And at the time I was a science teacher and I had two students who went in to go and get some food. Please don't judge me on, on the health side of things. And the officer rides up to me and says, are we all right there, mate? Now, as a young person growing up in Brixton, that's, that, 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 was, that was quite weird, you know? Police officers didn't talk to you like that. We didn't have that relationship. So I, I said, right. And he said to me, gonna be doing any stabbings today? And it genuinely made me laugh because he caught me so off guard with that. And I said to him, actually, I'm a science teacher waiting for my students to, to come out so I can do continue the tutoring. And he, his response was, oh my God, well, you know, there's lots of stabbings and shootings going over here. And, and I just thought to myself, this, how do I stop this? You know, and at the time I got introduced to a guy called Wesley Stevenson, who was the chair of the um, CPCG or Community Police Consultative Group. And I attended one of the meetings and I saw at the top table we had the borough commander, he had the, the leader of the council at the time, and a lot of other influential people. And I, and I could just see how the, the interaction was going on and him holding them to account. This literally led me to me, I, as after that, I got on every single board possible. So I became the, the vice chair of the independent advisory group to Lambeth Police. I became the vice chair, uh, the chair of the Stop and Search Monitor group. I became the chair of the Pan London Stop and Search Community Monitor Network, um, which looks after Stop and Search across, the, um, across London. I sit on five advisory groups at Scotland Yard, including Public Order, TSG. I'm also the vice chair of the Trident Independent Advisory Group at Scotland Yard. And for me, one of the things I always say to people in the community is that without being involved and sitting at the seats of power where these policies are, are suggested and debated before they, they're put into stone. Because it seems to me that, especially within our community, we, we only become vocal when things get passed, which is not, not, not a great thing to do. But we have to also remember in Lambeth, for example, out of the, we have approximately 320,000 residents. Of that, the council has accepted 27% as living on the poverty line or just under with the highest rates of youth violence, highest incidence of mental health, highest rates of HIV, second highest rates of teen pregnancy. And I've said, as I've said previously, one in three children is born into poverty. So you can imagine families going through this whole myriad of issues. Prioritizing membership in panels is not really what they're doing. We, we expect people in our community to thrive when they're still struggling to survive. And I feel like there's a big understanding that has to come from that, not just from the establishment but also us who who represent a lot of people in our communities i think at this time we need inspirational leadership you know but it also feels that everyone's trying to be a leader as if there's no positions apart from leadership there's no we don't really see within our communities the the the, the capturing of data to be shared with everyone we're not really seeing the the that kind of core organization it shouldn't take the murder of, of george floyd for us to realize what kind of situation we're in. And for me, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really bolstered and positive because of, of some of the people in, in this group, just sharing their experiences, hearing what they've gone through and what they've gone on to achieve. But again, we also have to value our community. You know, just again, apologies. I am a bit biased because I really do love Lambeth and think it's the best bar in the world. However, I will, um, 
I will balance that by actually giving examples. So in, in, in Lambeth, we've got an ex-gang member. And as a youth worker, I've done youth work since 2000, this guy was so active in terms of criminality. And his name is Carl Loco. And, you know, he was one of the few people that was invited to Prince Harry's wedding, you know? And guess what? The newspapers couldn't let him go live. Wolf, they had on the newspaper as, as a type of typical of the Daily Mail, obviously. They had from gang leader to Prince Harry's inner circle. And I thought, why can't you just celebrate? You know, we've got David Bowie, who comes from Brixton. We've got a former mayor in, in terms of John Major, you know, at least it wasn't Margaret Thatcher, right? Um, we've got former, f former um, London mayor in Ken Livingston, who used to live in, in, in Brixton got people like Dylan White, we've got Liverpool player um, Nathaniel Klein, who I, I actually used to be my vice captain for my youth club team, you know, and we've got so many resources in our community, but sometimes it feels like politics makes us so insular that we forget to involve people that are not political. Even me, before, before I became a councillor, I had only voted twice, and one of those votes was for myself, if I'm being totally honest. So even now, I don't think I'm that politically astute in terms of the inner workings of, you know, different factions and different political parties and opinions on policies, etc. But for me, I feel like there's a level of purity we have to keep. And that purity comes from honesty and experience. We have to continue to listen to, to our communities and actually represent them. None of the, the positions that we occupy should be for ourselves. And sometimes, in, in my experience, I've found when you get to... Um, you know, panels and, and positions of, of influence, it becomes very obvious that you start seeing less and less brown faces. And sometimes we want to feel special and we want to be, you know, uh, I'm the only, uh, you know, for me saying I'm the first Somali councillor in Lambeth in, in 2018 wasn't something I celebrated. It was something that really brought sadness to me because I thought, so, as Somalis, we've been here since the 1940s and it's taken until 2018 for us to get representation here. Now, the question is, are there blockers or is there a lack of uh, involvement and wanting to engage? And I think it's both. And I think we, we, we can't try and work on one side of the problem and leave the other alone. We have to make sure we kick down the doors of, of opportunity, but also make sure we begin to populate ourselves and become active and present when these things are happening. I just wanted to leave on, on two points or maybe three points. So uh, f first quote was the real tragedy behind poverty is what it does to your hopes and dreams. And for me, again, I think it feels like being black and living in poverty has become synonymous. And that's something we need to break because we have so many brilliant people and we've got so much, so much to bring to the economy. We just have to be brave and start supporting each other properly. Um, next quote is the real tragedy of the poor is the poverty of their aspirations. And again, for me, it's not always about money. It's about instilling hope in our young people and hope through, through our example in, in how we address things and how we strive and, and, and get through things. And I feel like every single one of us has got a story and sometimes we forget that there are people that we can't see that are depending on us and, and putting their kind of hopes on how much success we can exhibit. So there's a bigger responsibility than just us in terms of what we're, we're striving to do. And the final one, I think this is something that we should be pushing out to, to wider society is that, they sh of course, our communities have gone through extensive trauma, you know, and I don't have to continue to say because, you know, if I talk about slavery as this, if it was in the past, I feel like it's just done differently. And for me, we shouldn't just see the trauma the community has gone through, but also look at the amount of resilience that we've had to build to survive it. You know, we've developed and harnessed so much negativity and turned it positive. We're an amazing people. And I think it is more than time for us to be exhibiting that to, to wider society. So I think every single one of us in, in this room now that's, that's listening to these conversations, we should be taking that away and making sure that we shine as bright as we possibly can. Because without us, the next generation will have, they'll be growing up in darkness. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you.